important notes about online learning. On the course page, you'll find a very useful document with some hints and tips on how to manage your data and to reduce your data consumption. Download the slides and go through them along with the video or audio and please pay special attention to the lecture outcomes. The outcomes tell you what you need to be able to do in order to pass the assessment. This means that the outcomes define the scope of your assessment. You still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words and this is going to be very important for your own understanding. You still need to go through the prescribed reading and do the exercises. And you still need to explore further through additional reading, online investigation. For instance, YouTube has some wonderful linguistic resources. Remember that your evidence of engagement will all be part of your portfolio. Every lecturer hopes that all students do these things anyway. But when you are doing online learning from home, the opportunities to do so are quite different. It becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. Hold tight and enjoy the lecture. Evidence for linguistic structure, agreement and C command. Here are a list of outcomes which, I, which explain what you need to know by the end of the module and as such explain the scope of any assessment you might have. Please pause on the screen and familiarize yourselves with these. So we started out by looking at some of the evidence for hierarchical structure and um, after having recapped a bit of linguistics one we looked at constituency and then started looking at more detail in a particular relationship that we find between constituents, namely C command. We first we looked at polarity items to introduce the notion of C command. And in this lecture, we will be looking at agreement. Agreement occurs when a grammatical item co-varies based on features of another grammatical item. So what does this mean exactly? Well, the marking on one category changes when another category, which might be quite a way distant from it, in the structure also changes. So here are some examples. This is, an ex uh, this is a German example. It means the woman helped the men. There are a number of features that seem to be present. First of all, we see singular features as well as F for feminine. So we can see that the woman, which is feminine and singular, results in third person singular agreement on the tensed verb and feminine singular agreement on the determiner. Looking at the second part of the sentence, we will see that the, the sequence den Männer geholfen, which means help the men, is also characterized by a set of agreements. For instance, we see that men, which is masculine and plural, and also incidentally in the dative case, triggers agreement on the determiner, den, which agrees in masculinity and plurality. Here is another example, this time from Swahili, which means their lateness annoyed me. And in this case, we see that Swahili is a language that agrees in terms of noun class. And in this particular example, it is noun class 15 that triggers agreement. So the de-verbal noun being late, as kind of a gerund, has noun class marker 15 on it, ku, which triggers noun class 15 agreement on the possessive. And these two words together constitute the subject noun phrase, which trigger subject agreement for noun class 15 on the verb to annoy. So let's look at some common features that make their presence felt in natural languages. In the phrase, these books, the plurality of the noun is reflected in the plurality of the determiner. We would say that the determiner agrees with the noun. Number agreement can also be expressed in verbs. I am a student, we are students. She is a student, they are students. In each of these pairs, we can see the effect of singular or plural on the verb. Another type of important feature in natural language is person. Person is divided into three, first person, second person, and third person typically. And examples are, I am a student, you are a student, and she is a student. In each of these cases, the verb reflects a different person marking as a result of agreement between the subject and the verb. Some languages have extensive grammatical gender systems. Grammatical gender is a bit confusing because it is not the same thing as social gender. Grammatical gender merely refers to the fact that different words occur in different word classes. What does make it a little complicated is that in some languages, grammatical gender may sometimes reflect sociological gender and sometimes not. English doesn't have a particularly extensive gender system, but we can see it in examples like he shaved himself, where himself is an anaphore which agrees in gender with the masculine pronoun he. Similarly, in a sentence like the ship rocked gently at her moorings, 
The ship is construed as feminine gender and agrees with a feminine possessive marker, her. So perhaps one of the reasons why people get themselves so tied up in knots about the distinction between grammatical gender and social gender is that English doesn't really have a very well-developed grammatical gender system. So aside from pronouns and perhaps some exotic examples involving ships and large machinery and perhaps countries and castles, there aren't really very many good examples of grammatical gender at work in English. So let's look at a few more examples from other languages. So French has a two gender system, masculine and feminine. German has uh, three genders and I've got some examples here to try and show you that grammatical gender and social gender do not necessarily match up. So the word for the man is man, which is masculine, and when you have a determinant in front of it, it becomes der Mann, where der is nominative masculine and agrees with the features of man. Similarly with woman, die Frau, the determinant changes to a feminine nominative form of the the determiner, which agrees with the feminine features of Frau. Where this becomes maybe a little bit interesting is with a word like Mädchen, which refers to a girl child. So this is socially gendered as feminine, but it is grammatically gendered as neuter. So the determiner in front of Mädchen is das Mädchen, which is a nominative neuter form of the determiner. So here we can clearly see that social gender and grammatical gender do not match. In fact, the word for child, das Kind, is also in the neuter paradigm. Here's another example. The phrase mein Schatz means mein dear, and it is a phrase you might use for a, a close and intimate partner. And it could be used no matter what social gender your partner identified with. So the word Schatz is grammatically masculine. And it is agreed with by the possessive mein, which is a masculine version of the possessive because it has to agree with the masculine noun shuts. Just incidentally, the feminine version would be something like minor. So what's interesting here is that mein shuts, although it is grammatically masculine, is not linked to social gender in any way at all. It can be used for anyone that is near and dear to you, irrespective of the social gender that they might identify with. Together, person, number, and gender features are often referred to as phi features, represented by the Greek symbol phi. Other types of features we might come across include tense and time reference. For instance, I am a student, I was a student, and I will be a student. And in those cases, we see that the verb reflects tense and time reference of the event. Another type of inflection that is visible is case. For example, in the sentence, she saw her, she and her both refer to feminine entities. However, because of where they occur in the sentence, they appear in a slightly different form. She is a so-called nominative, her is a so-called accusative. Actually, in English, it is probably more proper to just refer to nominative versus non-nominative, as the distinction between different types of non-nominatives is not morphologically marked in English. The sentence, her saw a cat, is ungrammatical because instead of a nominative marker, there is a non-nominative marker in that position. And similarly, the phrase, the cat saw she, is ungrammatical because she is a nominative in the position where we would expect a non-nominative. Similar effects occur within pronouns. For instance, in English, pronouns apply a non-nominative case to their noun phrase. So you can say with him, but not with he. There are many other kinds of features that occur in syntax, but these are some of the basic ones that you should be familiar with. In fact, inflectional markings in English tend not to be too complicated, and English is often referred to as being morphologically impoverished. In other languages, which are more well-behaved with respect to inflection, there's a much more varied range of inflections that may occur. For example, in French. For example, if you look at the column of present tense verbs in French, you'll see how the form of the verb changes with respect to both person and number or plurality. If you look at the column for imperfect past, you'll notice some similarities with the present. For instance, the first person plural is also represented by on, and the second person plural 
is represented by air. And if you look at the future column, you will once again note some similarities with the other columns. But in this case, there's a consistent R sound that occurs before the person markers, which is probably the future tense marker. In all of these examples, it is the verb which agrees with the subject. So the five features of the subject determine the morphological markings on the verb. And in turn, the verb is also marked for tense. Let's look at gender and some other features in more detail. In French, if you wanted to say the little boy, boy is masculine, then the determiner and the adjective would also reflect the masculine. In the example on the slide, you can't really see the masculine endings because there are null morphemes. They become much clearer when you look at the feminine. If you wanted to say the little girl, a girl is feminine, and feminine marking is reflected on both the determiner and the adjective. If you wanted to say the little girls plural or the little boys plural, you will notice that both gender and number are reflected on the adjective and on the determiner. French has just two genders, whereas a language like German has three, namely masculine, feminine and neuter. In example 5 on the screen, er ist ein guter Mann. Mann is masculine and this is reflected in a masculine adjective and a masculine determiner. In contrast, child, kind, is regarded as neuter, and we see neuter morphological marking on the adjective. Finally, Frau is feminine, and we see feminine markings on the adjective and on the determiner. I would just like to remind you that this does not necessarily reflect sociological gender. Although in these three examples, one might like to make the argument that this is so, a look at the broader lexicon of German demonstrates that all nouns fall into a gender of some form or other, irrespective of whether that might be a sociological gender or not. For instance, a dog is masculine, cats are feminine, and horses are neuter. Some languages don't use gender per se, but rather use noun classes in a more general sense. For instance, all the indigenous South African languages, barring Afrikaans, use noun classes. When we move away from the Indo-European languages, we see that having a two or three gender system is perhaps on the low side of being able to classify nouns. And in fact, it is much easier to be confused between grammatical and social gender when you've only got two or maybe three genders. However, when we look at the Bantu language family, we will see that there are many, many ways of classifying nouns. In fact, there are perhaps up to 18 different noun classes. And to show that, I've got an example of some Susutu noun class markers on the screen. So Susutu noun class markers come in pairs, 1 and 2, 1a and 2a, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, 9 and 10, etc. Where typically the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, refer to a singular, and the even numbers refer to a plural. So how would that work? For instance, let's look at noun classes 1 and noun class 2. And you'll see in the example there, the prefix for noun class 1 is mo. And that gives us mosadi, which means a woman. And the prefix for noun class 2 is ba, which gives us basadi, which is woman, plural. Now let's contrast that with noun classes 3 and 4. The prefix for noun class 3 is mo. An example is mose, which means dress, and the plural for dresses is mese, and that's because the noun class prefix for noun class 4 is me. And similarly, if you look at noun classes 5 and 6, leleme means tongue, maleme means tongues. So one of the things to note here is the actual number 1, 2, 1a, 2a, 3 or 4, etc. is done by linguistic convention. And these numbers are the labels that linguists give to these different groups of nouns or ways of classifying nouns. And that's because if you've got a large number, such as 18, it is easier to give them a number rather than to try and give them distinct names, such as, for instance, masculine, feminine, or neuter, or common, etc. So that's why they have the numbers that they do. Obviously, when you are a native speaker of one of these languages, you do not think of it in terms of numbers per se. You would rather just think of them as groups of nouns or noun classes. And it just happens to be one of those facts about language that the word for woman, Mosadi, fits into noun class 1 and 2, whereas the word for father fits into noun classes 1a and 2a. And 
dress is associated with noun class 3 and 4, and tongue with 5 and 6. While on the other hand, the word for dog, ncha, is associated with noun classes 9 and 10. Exactly the same thing happens in Isikosa. I've got the noun class paradigm on the screen. You can pause the video and look at it in your own time, but it works in exactly the same way. It just seems to be one of those facts about language that different nouns are grouped together in different classes and that these classes tend to have some or other morphological marking associated with them. And we can immediately see from a language with a large number of classes that there is absolutely no attempt made to link grammatical gender or noun classes, as it were, to social gender. There really is just no link between them at all. And so the confusion between grammatical gender and social gender, I think, is largely a product of us being excessively focused on Indo-European languages and on English in particular. Although it is a well-known fact that languages of the Bantu language family have noun classes of this sort, they are not the only languages which use noun classes in this kind of way. Noun classes occur in Ojibwe, Navajo, Northern Athabascan languages, Basque is another language that uses noun classes, as are languages in the Caucasian family, including Bats and Andy, which seems to have a noun class exclusively reserved for insects. Several Australian Aboriginal languages also have noun classes. For instance, the Yabal has four major noun classes, which tend to be divided along the following semantic lines. Noun class 1 includes animate objects and men. Noun class 2 includes water, fire, violence and women. Noun class 3 includes edible fruit and vegetables and four includes just various other things. This rather strange categorization of the nouns of the language led to the title of a famous book by Lakoff called Women, Fire and Dangerous Things. The other thing that this kind of categorization emphasizes is just how arbitrary these kinds of genders or noun classes are. It seems that words are placed more or less at random different noun classes and really seem to make sense in a logical way. There is absolutely no need to memorize all these noun classes. I merely want you to be aware that these things exist. In order to say one student is speaking, a student is a noun class 1, marked by the prefix um, and we gloss it simply as 1. The numeral omnye is prefixed by an agreement morpheme for noun class 1. And the verb is prefixed by u, which again is an agreement marker for noun class 1. We gloss this often as sm1, meaning subject marker for noun class 1. In contrast, the word for policeman just happens to be in noun class 5, and of course the plural policeman would be in noun class 6. The word policer is marked by noun class 5 e, and this links to an agreement marker eli on 1 and li on the verb. Example 3 shows the phrase his small children in Isizulu, and once again you can see the noun class 2 marker occurring on the noun, on the possessive, and also on the adjective. Example 4 simply shows that you can't substitute one form of agreement with another because this would lead to strong ungrammaticality. So you can't replace the ba with za, for instance. Now there are some questions that arise, for instance we might like to ask, do all languages have features? Well it seems that languages do vary quite a lot with respect to the overt inflection that they have. For example, Isikosa has quite a lot of noun class, let's call that gender number marking, but very little in the way of case marking. Afrikaans inflects nouns for singular and plural, but has no personal number marking on its verbs. Norwegian, depending on which dialect, has two or three genders for nouns, but verbs are very simply marked with either finite or non-finite marking. It would appear that all languages seem to have more or less the same types of features, but not all are morphologically expressed. So features may be active syntactically, but not morphologically visible. And in some instances, they may be inactive syntactically and also morphologically invisible. Another question we might like to ask is, why do we need these features at all? The existence of languages like Afrikaans with very little inflection demonstrates that it is perfectly feasible to have a language with no inflection. So it doesn't seem to be the case that inflection has any functional value per se. It also seems to be the case that children acquiring a language with little inflection like Afrikaans seem to acquire it at much the same pace as children acquiring languages with a lot of inflection like Turkish or Isizulu. So the presence or absence of inflectional morphology doesn't seem to have much bearing on the difficulty of acquiring languages, at least for small children. When it comes to adults learning language, we all know 
that inflection systems can make some languages incredibly difficult to acquire for adults. However, this doesn't seem to apply for children. All this begs the question, why do we need features in language at all? Empirically, inflection is very common in human languages, and so we need to account for it in some way. For that reason alone, we are going to need features in our grammar. However, in modern syntactic theory, features play a much more important role than simply decorating words. At a theoretical level, features have developed into the very machinery that drives the syntactic derivation. Features are like little bundles of instructions that can tell a grammar what to do. And if we accept that features tell the grammar what to do, the question arises, how do features communicate with each other? How do features tell the grammar how to operate? The answer to this lies in the derivational cycle of merge, move, and agree. Every tree structure is derived through a process of first merging, then moving, and then applying agree, and then repeating that process over and over again until all the features are exhausted. Now, this might be quite abstract, but it should sound slightly familiar to you because we did it in a lecture in Linguistics 1. Let's use the magic of video to go back and recap. So first of all, we use our phrase structure rules to start with a basic sentence. Uh, and we would call that D structure. In case you're wondering what this D structure might look like, it might look a little bit like a syntactic tree. This process of putting constituents together to create a more complex tree we call merge. Inside the constituents there are features and features come in two main types. Interpretable features. These can remain in the derivation. Interpretable features have a little I in front of them and there can be things like interpretable tense, interpretable person, interpretable number and we've been talking about those features in some of our previous lectures. The other type of feature are called uninterpretable features. These are distinguished by having a little u in front of them. There could be an uninterpretable tense, uninterpretable person, uninterpretable number, for instance. And these features must be ticked off, usually through movement during the derivation, by a category with a corresponding interpretable feature. By ticked off, I want you to imagine a checklist of features which are gradually ticked off as the derivation proceeds. Uninterpretable verb features are ticked off by verbs, lexical verbs, auxiliaries, or modals. Uninterpretable question features, or uninterpretable WH features, are ticked off by words with question properties. For instance, when, where, who, what we normally refer to as WH items. You also get another kind of feature called an EPP feature, which can be ticked off by any noun phrase. EPP features work in a slightly different way, and we won't have to get into that during this call. Finally, constituents can move around in a tree, and you can only move a constituent to tick off a feature. That is to say, the rules of the syntax game do not allow us to move around any constituents any other time just because we want to it. This process is called move. So there are three basic rules, merge, agree, and move. It's really important to be able to distinguish between the descriptive linguistic term agreement, also known as concord, and the theoretical tool known as agree. Agreement is the visible morphological realization of an underlying relationship between the constituents or features of constituents. Agreement occurs when one constituent or marking on their constituent co-varies in relationship to another one. So agreement refers to the visible morphological marking and we can use it to describe language as we see it. However, as language scientists we do need to go beyond visual appearances and try and characterize the nature of agreement in itself. And in order to do that we need to theorize it, or in other words we need to integrate it into our theory of how language works. And we have gradually been building this theory as this course has progressed. So the way we do this is to postulate an operation called agree. This was first proposed by Chomsky around 1998, and it is one type of theoretical mechanism that has been proposed to explain the underlying relationship between features, and agree is also part of the derivational cycle. The derivational cycle, as you will recall, is the iterative application of merge, agree, and move. So the way agree works is something like the following. First of all, features in language 
are proposed to come in interpretable and uninterpretable pairs. The interpretable features have a little I in front of them, and so you will get something like interpretable person, interpretable number, interpretable gender, etc. And uninterpretable features come with a little U in front of them, such as uninterpretable person, uninterpretable number, uninterpretable gender, etc. And these features are just part of the natural specification of words in a particular language. So when an uninterpretable feature is merged or is put into the tree, then the uninterpretable feature probes its C command domain for a matching interpretable counterpart. What we mean by that is the uninterpretable feature looks into the tree and everything that it C commands, it searches to see if there is an interpretable counterpart to it that it can tick off against. Once it finds this counterpart or finds its soulmate, there is a matching relationship which occurs between the uninterpretable feature and the interpretable feature. And what happens is that the interpretable feature provides a value to the uninterpretable feature and renders it inert or inactive. Now, this might sound a little abstract at the moment, and it is, but it will become clearer as we do some examples. Before we can do that, however, it is important to go through some typical feature bundles, and it is really important that you become really familiar with these ones. For a finite tense node, it will be characterized with an interpretable tense feature, uninterpretable five features, which means a kind of a shorthand for person, number, and gender, and it will have interpretable case. We haven't covered a lot about case, but trust me, this feature is going to be there. All nouns will be specified as having interpretable five features and uninterpretable case features. What this effectively means is that a noun like cat has a person, third person, a number, singular, and a gender, if the language specifies gender. And the uninterpretable case feature will require that the noun somewhere in the derivation obtains case. A preposition is usually specified with an interpretable case feature, so it can assign case. Verbs have a variety of features, depending on whether they are transitive or intransitive, etc. And this relates mainly to their theta features. So a verb might assign an agent theta role, or a patient theta role, or a beneficiary theta role, etc. A verb also has an interpretable case feature to which it can apply to its object. Question words typically have an interpretable WH feature on them, while complementizers associated with question words, so a complementizer specified with a WH feature, will typically have an uninterpretable question feature on it. So let's see how this might work practically. If we're drawing a tree, our verb phrase contains the verb smell, tense, consists of an interpretable tense feature, in this case, a present tense, an interpretable case feature, uninterpretable person, and uninterpretable number. And we will then merge our noun phrase subject, such as a goat. And this noun phrase has the following features, interpretable person, number, so it is a third person and singular, and has uninterpretable case. Now we see there are still some other uninterpretable features in the tree, namely uninterpretable five features on the tense node. In the same way, these uninterpretable features will try and look for an equivalent interpretable set of five features. And C command goes from the main node up one and then down. And sure enough, it'll find interpretable five features on the noun phrase. Once it's found those, this checking agreement happens and the uninterpretable person number features are checked off and the information from the interpretable ones are provided to them. And ultimately what this means is that person and number are going to be spelled out on the tense node. And we see that on the verb does, which we can recognize as present tense, third person, and singular. So what we see here is that agree occurs between the noun phrase and the tense node, and in so doing, transfers some information between the two. The person and number information, which is inherent to the noun, is placed, as it were, onto the tense node, and then it is reflected morphologically there, whereas the case feature, which is part of the tense node, transfers its information over to the noun phrase, and ultimately the noun phrase is going to be spelled out in the nominative form. Now, if we are suggesting that agree uses C command, 
Well, we already know some of the properties of C command. We should be able to demonstrate that agree must be limited by the properties of C command that we learned about last week. So let's see how we can do this. Let's start off with some basic sentences like linguistics is a nice subject. And we will see that the agreement is singular there. And students are very devoted to their studies. And we'll see that students triggers plural agreement. These very basic sets of sentences are really just to show what types of agreement are triggered by the words linguistics and students, respectively. Now, if we combine them into something a bit more complex, we might end up with a sentence like, students of linguistics are in the class. But it would be ungrammatical to say, students of linguistics is in the class. So based on the fact that we have plural agreement in this example, we know that the controller of the agreement is the students, because the students trigger plural agreement. We can also see in this example that linguistics is not controlling the agreement. And if we were to draw a tree, we would be able to see why that might be the case. So in our tree, the noun phrase subject students of linguistics consists of a noun phrase headed by the noun students with prepositional phrase of linguistics as an adjunct to that noun phrase. And we can see that noun phrase one, C commands the verb and as such, Noun phrase one, which consists of the students, triggers plural agreement on the verb. So here we can see a nice example that shows that agree operates through the process of C command. And this allows us to make a prediction about which nouns trigger agreement and which ones don't. Incidentally, this example also shows that agreement isn't just about a linking between two items that are linearly close. In this example, the word linguistics and the verb are adjacent to each other. They are linearly close. And yet, it is not the word linguistics which triggers agreement. And this is because even though the word linguistics is close in terms of a linear order, it is actually quite far away in terms of a structure. We can take this a little bit further and actually use it to troubleshoot certain linguistic structures. And one of these structures, which might be a little bit complicated at first, might seem to be a possessive. So we're going to start off with two basic sentences, just showing what is triggering agreement. You could say a child is very talented, which shows that a child triggers singular agreement, or toys are on the floor, showing that toys trigger plural agreement. There's nothing particularly complicated about these sentences. All we are doing is showing that a singular noun triggers singular agreement and a plural noun triggers plural agreement. Let us put these into a possessive structure and have a look and see what happens. We could end up with something like the following. My child's toys are on the floor. Or we could trigger a singular agreement with the following type of sentence. My children's pet is up for sale. Now, if we were to draw that kind of tree, we might end up with something like this. Sentence breaks into a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and the noun phrases in the subject are stacked. Noun phrase one, noun phrase two, and noun phrase phrase three, for instance. So how do we know if this is the right kind of structure? Well, drawing on what we know about agreement, namely that it is subject to the rules of C command, we can make some predictions from this kind of tree. So for instance, we know descriptively that toys is triggering the plural agreement in my child's toys on the floor. The question then is, can the noun phrase containing toys see command the verb? So we start at noun phrase three, and we would look up and then down, and you can immediately see that noun phrase three is not able to see command the verb. This structure that we've postulated as underlying the sentence then makes a prediction, and the prediction is that Noun phrase three should not trigger plural agreement. But we can clearly see from the data that we are dealing with plural agreements. And so we then are led to believe that perhaps this is not the correct structure. There is another possible structure that we could draw, and it is illustrated on this next tree. The linear order is the same. My child's toys are on the floor. But in this case, you see that the noun phrases are stacked slightly differently. Now, when we look at it, we'll see that noun phrase one, which is headed by the noun toys, is indeed able to see command the verb. From noun phrase one, we look up to S and then down, and eventually we trace our way to the verb R. 
and then we can see that noun phrase one triggers plural agreement. So what we've done here is actually quite significant. We've not only postulated a theoretical tool with which we can explain language phenomena, but we can also use that same tool to troubleshoot some of the syntactic structures that we are confronted with. And based on this, we're able to say that this tree diagram is probably the correct structure, whereas the previous tree diagram was not the correct structure. Summary and next steps. We have seen that agreement and the underlying features that it represents are endemic in natural languages. It seems that languages are filled with various types of agreement which seem to serve little semantic function. And we know this because some languages are very rich in agreement, such as Russian and Isiposa, while other languages have very impoverished agreement paradigms. For instance, Creole languages, Afrikaans and Norwegian, for example. But since both morphologically rich and morphologically impoverished languages seem perfectly functional to their speech communities, it seems clear that the morphological features themselves don't play a huge semantic function. So a big question is, why should languages be structured in this way? Or alternatively put, why do we need features in our theory at all? At a simple level, we need features in our theory because we see these features in natural languages. But ultimately, we don't just want our theories to be able to describe what languages do, but also be able to explain why languages are structured in the way they are. For this reason, feature checking through the agreement mechanism has been developed into the very machinery that drives the syntactic derivation, or put another way, agreement may very well lie at the heart of building sentences. If this idea is on track, then grammatical features are little bundles of instructions that can tell the grammar what to do in order to build a tree. And how would these features communicate with each other? Well, they do so through the agreement mechanism, which serves to link up different constituents through C command and feature checking. In later lectures, when we get to movement and transformations, you'll be able to see how different feature bundles are instrumental in creating and driving different movements inside syntactic trees and the derivations themselves.